pod sass by putting the sass back in sassy sponsored by leader pro where you can book demos with target customers on demand and fill your sales pipeline instantly all right welcome to pod sass today uh our guest is justin beals from strike graph how's it going justin i'm doing great it's great to join you always exciting to uh connect with someone um on the podcasting space it's really been growing like crazy hasn't it yeah yeah it's it, it definitely has been growing um and i love the podcast space because you can reuse the content for multi-purposes so everything from audio visual to blog posts and doing the transcription of the actual content is it's been very useful and you know i think in terms of like just creating content and seo presence and all that kind of stuff a lot of roi from it so yeah, I think discussion is an important like learning opportunity too, not only for you and I, I'm sure we'll have a fun, a lot of fun learning from each other, but also listeners, right, who are trying to pick up new information. And sometimes, you know, I think, I think it's a learning technique, like listening to someone discuss uh, is a great way to pick up new information. Yeah. That's also one of uh, the not so direct um, advantages of doing this exercise for me too, is actually like, uh, you know, we're launching a product um, that's kind of like an automated version of what we've been doing on, on uh, as a growth marketing agency. Um, but now we're automating some of these processes that we've been doing for two years. And so, you know, as I kind of go into this new role, even though we have like 20 employees right now, like uh, having to talk to, having the opportunity to speak with other founders that kind of have gone through a lot of these like, you know, learning exercises and teaching moments, I think is also very valuable for me selfishly, where I'm like crowdsourcing the best information from everybody and then learning, you know, what, what to expect. And also, uh, you know, I think the idea we've touched upon this a lot, but the idea of culture and building culture and every company is so unique. And a lot of it, a lot of the times it's a, it's a, it's an extension from the founder's experience, own personal experiences. Um, and so that's also been a very like curious topic for me, but yeah. Um, we can dive right in. Uh, before we get to what we like to do is like a series of just rapid fire questions. Um, I love this, you know, present the opportunity for you to just give us like the elevator pitch around, you know, what Strike Graph is, what you guys do, um, as well as just like who, who makes a, a strong candidate as a target customer for you. Sure. Um, so Strike Graph uh, helps businesses acquire and retain the trust assets they need to drive revenue. And specifically, what we help our customers do is pass critical security certifications or audits. The most common is a SOC 2 Type 2, um, which was written by the AICPA and is performed by a certified public accountant. But there are others that um, are embedded in our platform, like ISO 27001, uh, PCI DSS, uh, the new ISO 27701, that's the privacy standard. And we're also very active in the health tech space. So HIPAA and starting to do some initial work around high trust. So like technical compliance. That's right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to dissuade you from an assumption of technical compliance. The truth is, is that a lot of these um, security compliance certifications, about 50 to 70 percent of the controls that you'll operate are business oriented and not technology oriented. Interesting. OK. Yeah. Okay. And who makes like a good customer from based on what you're explaining, I would imagine fintech companies. And then you just said also health tech, right? Yeah, it's pretty broad. Any B2B company, essentially, if you're selling to other businesses, and especially if you're selling to businesses that are, let's say, above um, 15 people, and they deal with technology or the sharing of data, you're going to have to get one of these certifications to get a deal over the line. All right. Um, I'm going to want to dive into a lot more of that. But before we do, we would like to get to know Justin as a person. So uh, we're going to go through a series of just real quick rapid fire questions. Nothing, nothing too crazy. Yeah. Um, so just to kick things off, this is our easy intro question is, uh, do you have a favorite entrepreneur? Maybe not as an individual, but as an organization. My favorite story is Nintendo. I, I, I really love that here's a 150 year old company that from day one was innovating in games they wanted to people to play they had a strong focus they had a, a strong and they built an expertise not only that like over the past 150 years they built marketplace after marketplace after marketplace and so uh, not only do i play their games but i'm a big fan of them as a business yeah i remember i think seeing a picture of like a the, 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 like one of the original nintendo shops which is like 
in an alleyway almost it feels like, right? With just like the Nintendo logo on the top. Um, and you're like, that's where it started. Um, you know, and it's yeah, it's crazy the fact that they are a 150 year old company. They're not like this Apple with like, you know, they're they're like in the garage before the garage became a thing, um, which is pretty cool and pretty awesome to see. And they keep doing it, right? I mean, isn't that amazing? I think so, I th things like the Switch uh, console that they brought out, some of the games that they've produced lately are highly creative and really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I remember blowing into those cassettes and <laughs> <laughs> Super Mario 3 was what it was. <laughs> we would have like, a, oh, that's funny. It just brought up a memory. I had my little <laughs> sister, would, like me, I have two siblings and we would have our youngest sister hold the cassette place in place while me and my sister <laughs> so you had to get all the electrical connections working right or exactly. blow out the dust in the in the the cartridge yeah <laughs> yeah that's funny um do you have a favorite game old or new from Nintendo? um actually my i think my favorite old nintendo game is super mario brothers 3 as well i, I had it was very creative right like lots of different environments to play in a uh, new one would have to be uh, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I don't do too much. I'm I'm a little older, so I don't do too much of like the competitive gaming where everyone gets in. I, I like my own little space. Um, yeah. Got it. Yeah. That, that, Nintendo in that day and age was like the extent of my gaming experience. Like Super Mario Brothers 3 is where I finished. I, I stopped after that point. Uh, but it was, yeah, it was super inventive. I, I, yeah, brought back just a lot of memories when you brought that that, that name up. So um, even from like going to the store the first time to get it, it was like we we're like late to the game, maybe like a year after it actually came out. And uh, and then I just remember how excited I was as a kid. But it was, it was cool. Isn't it crazy how that company has created an emotional experience for much of the world, right? Yeah, yeah. And when your brand can do that as a technology company, I feel like that's that's a big win. It's very hard, very hard to do. Especially repeatable. Um, yeah, exactly. Repeatably. <laughs> yeah. No, seriously. Is there a piece of advice that you've ever been given where you kind of have been like kind of deferred back to that you see in practice, you know, whether it's daily or weekly, professionally, personally? Yeah, probably the one I repeat the most uh, for everyone I work with, especially at StriCraft, is that we kind of live and die as a team. You know, there's no even on small software development teams, you know, where I kind of uh, cut my teeth from a career perspective, it was more important to be a good teammate than to be the most technically advanced engineer. That, that was critical. And so uh, it's really helped me get the maximum contribution uh, that is available from those teammates for the best outcome of the entire organization. And was that like self-taught or was that, is that something that you picked up along the way? I think self-taught. I, I think that there, uh, what I learned, I was humbled with often, is that anytime I myself, you know, felt like I was the the quote unquote leader or the the best decision maker or always needed to drive, um, I you know inevitably we had an issue. And similarly, when I saw others that maybe didn't allow other teammates to contribute effectively you know, you'd lose them and then the team would feel really, you know, lost, you know. And so over over time to help quell the uber ego that might be happening in the organization, I would remind us all that, hey, we're just teammates, right? Like this is not about the lead engineer ruling over everything that we do, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And there's great evidence that that type of um, community driven effort, I, I read a really intriguing article that when you have a community driven decision, the majority of the time that community thinks they chose wrong, but the majority of the time they actually chose the right selection. When you have an individual driven decision, uh, they think they're right most of the time, but they are most of the time wrong. Yeah, I, I've been um, picking up a lot and and trying to digest a lot more around the idea of like servant leadership. And, um, you know, I think like being there to, you know, add in the leadership role, but like, how you know, even though you're in that role, you're there to live and, and serve your team, right? Like, and, and it's more important to do that, to help people get unblocked so they can be the best at what they do. Um, which ideally and hopefully, you know, is is uh, complementary to what your strongest skill sets are, your weaknesses are. So, 
yeah, I think that level of awareness is is supremely critical, and and obviously it's not always uh, a fostered in in professional environments. So, um, cool. And uh, I defer a lot to different types of content, whether that's movies, music, you know, books and stuff like that. Um, is there anything that you know, content wise, it could be a book also that's like a you that's like you've learned a lot from, motivated you, inspired you, or gave you like best practices. You know, I, I tend to not read um, a lot of business books, <laughs> to be frank, but I, lo I love science and technology. I think uh, one of the books that I've read recently that has had a pretty um, kind of an altering worldview for me is 1491 by Charles C. Mann. That's a, a nonfiction, and it covers uh, the state of the Americas just prior to Columbus landing. You know, what was society like, what were populations like, and what was the impact of, of really, in a big way, disease uh, in the Americas. And I think it's like getting a picture of the dinosaurs a little bit. You're kind of like, you look at this major impactful moment, you know, in this massive community, and all of a sudden you realize how ephemeral um, existence can be, the things that we rely on. It's a very powerful story um, about humanity in a way, yeah. Have you had a really bad job in the past? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Uh, you know. Sometimes uh, you don't know, right? It's like yeah. I feel like a lot of like uh, I feel like a lot of you know technical founders, you know, kind of found their roles early, so they don't necessarily have like gone through you know maybe like the more manual labor type of stuff. But I don't know if you've gone through anything like that. Um, I did door-to-door -door sales for a summer. That was really? awful. Yeah. I killed it on my first day and spent three months like disappointing everybody because I can never repeat the, that outcome. <laughs> that was in the middle of college. And I, I actually studied theater in college, even though I was always a computer nerd. You know, I was always interested in computing and technology, but I, my, the, my theater degree is what I really wanted to do in school. And so I was scraping by for some work. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. <laughs> what did you want? To, did you, you wanted to be a performer? Yeah, an actor. Um, and then I got out of college and I started looking around at what a professional kind of situation would look like. And it, it looked like a long, long road and fraught with difficulties. And I was like, oh, you know, I... I have this skill with computers and I think that the team, uh, I had a colleague at British Telecom, a friend was like, yeah, we're trying to hire someone that knows how to work on modems and networking equipment. And I was like, oh, I, I know how to do that quite well. And so that was my first professional technology job. Yeah. All right. That said, you know, you coming from a theater background, you know, is there anything like a favorite movie that you have that, you know, I don't know. I feel like I get, I connect to stories a lot, right? So yeah. there's things like, uh, yeah, that it could be a movie, a play, you know, or, or what have you, but anything that you can kind of draw, like that draws a lot of emotion out of you um, in some way, shape or form. Well, recently I've been watching the series Dope Sick and I think it's just phenomenal. And talk, talk about like how business can go wrong, you know? Um, I just, and maybe it's great that I want to pay attention to, unethical practices and entrepreneurialism, you know, and, and kind of, I, I would like strike graph. I'd like the work that I do to be a net benefit for humanity. If it, I, if I can all help it. So I do find these kind of stories and I thought dope stick was incredibly well acted and well written and, and just great perspectives, everything from Purdue pharma to the, the individuals on the ground that were becoming addicted to opioids. Yeah. I feel like um, entertainers make great entrepreneurs um, just given that there's a lot of soft skills that translates over, um, you know, that's the intangibles in a person, which is like the ability to handle rejection and failure and still overcome that constantly. Right. Um, but is there anything, you know, I know that you didn't necessarily pursue it fully uh, after that, but you did study it. Uh, is there anything that from your theater background that you felt like, you know, you took away that helped you be a better entrepreneur or, or uh, you know, uh, um, yeah, or a better like leader in where you are now? Oh, I, it's foundational, Chris. Like, there's no way I would have had the um, success in developing businesses that I have without that particular degree. As a matter of fact, a lot of times I tell folks that someday I'll, I'm going to design an MBA that is literally two years of putting on plays. 
Because if you want to get the, the motion of what it feels like to do a startup, go pick a script, try to get a budget for it, try to get a group of actors to show up for rehearsal, get the set painted by the time opening night comes around, and then suffer the consequences of your art, you know, uh, directly, and then go do it again, you know? Yeah. So I tell people all the time that... Um, that I find the act of startups, of creating a new organization, a business, trying to make it sustainable, very similar to the motion of putting on a play. Yeah, I mean, to relate to that, like every film production, you know, that you go through is like a mini business from creating the LLC, you know, from the business organization element to then like hiring the teams. And it's like a short lived company knowing that you're going into it, but it's like you are building a company nonetheless. And you're taking, yeah, you're, you're taking a script and then you're having to actually produce it. So like the script be, you know, synonymous to a wireframe and then like making it actually visually come together and going through that experience and then having the users of the audience, you know, in this case, like actually respond to it, interact with it. It's so, it's so interesting. And it's like, yeah, I feel like it's, um, you're just a serial entrepreneur. If you're, con if you're in film production, it's like a certain degree are play, you know, producing plays, right. It's like, you're doing this over and over again. Um, that's, that's really interesting. I haven't had anybody who's come from that background. So, um, what would you, going back to the questions, I have a couple more and then we can just kind of, you know, wrap those things up, but you know, what did you want to be when you're growing up as a kid? Was it an actor? Uh, I started out wanting to be an astronaut or a scientist, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> I was really intrigued by it. And, um, and I read a lot. I grew up without television. So um, I, I constantly, constantly read. That was my outlet, you know, from a imagination perspective. And science was amazing to me. I, I found the stories, you know, the story arcs in science to be so inhumane, but, you know, human in a way too. Um, then uh, I think in high school, I caught the theater bug and got really excited about it and continued it through college, yeah. Any advice that you would give like your 18 year old self now? Uh, survive, <laughs> just get through the next four years, <laughs> get on the other side, get a sense of who you want to be, you know, and then live those shoes for a little while. Um, uh, you know, and kind of actually put off the world a little bit. Don't, don't let it terrify you. Uh, or be afraid, you know, I think for me at 18, thinking about going into theater for college, there's a lot of excitement, but also a lot of fear. Like this is like trying to be a rock star, right? Like who, who really gets it, you know? And I didn't, didn't have family in the entertainment industry. I didn't have connections there. So it felt very lonely, you know? Well, entrepreneurship ain't much different, man. <laughs> no, especially, you know, especially to get to the stage that you get to, right? Where you guys are right now, which is like, if you look at statistically speaking, I mean, it might be a little bit better than, you know, being a character actor to a certain degree, but it might be fairly similar in terms of like the percentage success rate. So um, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. yeah. Um, that being said, final, final question here, but it's an important one uh, is what do you want your legacy to be? I hope that the people that work around me uh, at places like Strike Graph um, really grew and were given opportunity to kind of, kind of expand their worldview. So, and the other thing I'd like the legacy to be is uh, I think a lot about sustainable organizations from a business perspective. So, you know, we, we are a venture capital backed startup and we're growing very quickly um, at, at a really rapid pace. At the same time, I want us to create a sustainability in this organization, you know, whether, whatever the exit is for the end of the day, if we build a great company, we'll have good options. And so both, I guess, on a very human level, I want the staff at Strikecraft to feel taken care of. I want them to feel like they were given opportunity to grow. I want them you know, when they do exit, no one's going to stay here for life, I don't think, um, to really have a next great opportunity teed up for them, some, the, the next thing to grow. For the organization, for our investors, for myself, you know, this, there's this joy in creating something that's very sustainable, very strong, um, and continuing to repeat our customers' success, right? I'm, I'm pretty rabid about that, that customer being successful at getting that trust asset, and we focus on it almost exclusively, you know, sometimes 
we let our competitors go out of our mind and are just like, let's just make sure that all our customers are well taken care of. Taking a step back, right? Uh, what was, what's kind of been your work history? I know you mentioned, um, you know, that you had a buddy that worked at the British Telecom and then got you involved there fairly early on, like out of college. Um, and it seems like you've been a pretty technical individual on your own in your own right. Um, self-taught for the most part it seems, but, uh, yeah, how did you how did you get to StrikeGraph? What has kind of like been your 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 work history there? Um, be, and then and I noticed from your LinkedIn too is like you know you've done and advised a number of startups prior to this as well. So you know how did you get from working from British Telecom then into the startup world or even starting your first business if it was you know before StrikeGraph? Uh, when I started at British Telecom, I think it was ninety six or ninety seven, and we were just getting the internet online. And, and let's face it, right? Like the internet has created entrepreneurial opportunity that didn't exist five years before it. And a lot of my peers uh, that were in college or, or were wrapping up at the time also went into tech internet jobs, you know, early on. I, I wasn't a traditional computer science student. I'm, I'm not even maybe a traditional computer science engineer in a lot of ways. And so I always had a little bit of an imposter syndrome at British Telecom. And then I worked at, um, I took a job at Bell South online, developing um, a number of websites. At that time, you could design and develop uh, both. So I was doing both. Um, and I wanted to start a company. I wanted a better culture, essentially, for myself, where I felt supported and celebrated um, challenged, um, but, but not like, not strict hierarchies, you know, where there was opportunity to take personal responsibility and, and realize personal success around some things. Now I lived in Atlanta, Georgia, so there wasn't a lot of venture capital and, and I was broke. <laughs> so I didn't have any money, but pretty soon in, in 2000, I, I was able to start my first company and this was a consulting company. Um, a lot of services businesses get built in Atlanta because there's a ton of, you know, Coca-Colas and Home Depots and Georgia Pacifics there that are contracting. And, uh, and then that really gave me the belief that I could build a company because between 2000 and 2009, I grew uh, Roundbox Global to about 130 consultants. And we had uh, pretty sizable offices in Costa Rica. We were one of the first uh, groups to start developing nearshore uh, resources for our team. And then um, I sold it in 2009. And then the purchaser, I helped fold a number of other companies into uh, what was originally Roundbox over the years that I worked with them. Yeah. So that gave me a taste of one, I, I knew I wanted to try and build a better company and I thought I could make a, a great leader. Uh, being able to accomplish it once meant that maybe I could do it a second time. And, and so I think from there, uh, as the CEO of Roundbox Global, I actually decided to focus more on my technology expertise. Um, and as the CEO of a services business, you're oftentimes called upon to help make technology decisions with your customers. Uh, so I typically played the role of chief technology officer and did a, or, or a, I also did a VP of product for a little while or a executive director of research and development. But I would, I, I, you know, would do two or three years at a job for a little while, help stand something up and then move on to the next really exciting project. And uh, eventually I um, started working with venture capital backed startups as a CTO early on. Um, have a real knack for building a great team, you know, from kind of zero to product delivery. And um, that actually brought me out to Seattle, Washington, where I was the chief technology officer for an AI startup here called Koru. And then how long ago from that to then starting StrikeGraph, which I, I think is like a few years old now, right? Three, two, three years old? Two years. This is our, this month is um, our two year anniversary. Yeah, we're super excited about that. Yeah, so I worked at Koru for about five years. That's actually where I first started getting the idea that this problem existed. So we were an AI startup and what we did was we would recommend the likelihood an applicant might be a high performer. And one of the things I was really terrified of was building AI tools that 
impacted, uh, well, they call it, the EEOC calls it like a protected class. So that would be a minority. And I was really nervous about the types of models we were building. And we built a bunch of testing tools to check them for bias in, in the wrong directions. And as I started working on these issues with AI, the customer concerns about that started cropping up too. Not only that, but the security of the data. And it was impacting our sales. Like we had a verbal from Goldman Sachs that took us two years to get through security review. And I was like, man, I've, I've run a cash-based business before. This is the number one impact we have to grow in our organization. Like if you can get a verbal with a salesperson in two to three months, but then take 24 months to actually sign a contract, right? Like that's impossible. You're, you're just, you're not going to be successful. And when I see a big problem like that, my entrepreneurial spirit kind of gets going. I'm like, is it solvable? Who's solving it today? Are they doing a good job? You know, what's missing? And there were people solving the problem, but not at scale. And, um, and it was mostly services-based businesses like auditors. And so it seemed like a, a really great opportunity for good technology to be built. That's, that's, that's very cool. So uh, walk me through like the, the, you know, when you leave and start Strike Graph, you know, uh, what that looks like. Because even though it's like round two for you, right, it still seems like a bit of time removed from your original business. Um, you know, the landscape's probably changed a little bit, right? And so, you know, and you're also going out trying to raise venture capital. Like, how do you, how did you walk me through like that, that initial steps, the thought process of this is a business I should start building. And then like this, the, the things that you, the actionable items you actually took. Cause I'm sure there's a lot of like, um, and that's part of, you know, the reason why we're doing these podcasts. It's like, I'm sure there's a lot of other individuals that probably don't necessarily have the, the experience already of like building a business, but are or have been in that role of like working with a company and maybe even at a startup in an executive role, um, but hasn't gone out and founded anything on their own and is like sitting on this problem or this idea. Um, if so, if you can walk us through those, those steps, that'd be great. I think one of the first things is I was just grappling with the problem a little bit was, you know, one of the things that you should do if this is a problem you're confronted with, you have responsibility for is, is there a solution already in the marketplace that is a leader? Because then I don't have to worry about it, right? I, I should move on to the next interesting problem. But what I found was that I found auditors trying to tell me how to run my technology program. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, uh, that's not right because we have unique technology. Every startup I've ever done had a unique set of technology and systems put together. And also that uniqueness is what made us valuable. And it's usually how you think about your differentiation. And um, the expenses were really high. And I kept looking at, at the way things were organized and thinking, I just need a really, really powerful uh, ontological structure for all this security content. And I wish, I wish I had a spreadsheet that would handle it all. Once I started grokking how I wanted to organize the problem from the operator perspective, I realized that the only other tools in the marketplace dictated technology choices. So you would be like, oh, you, well, you, you have to use this um, logging and monitoring tool. Otherwise, you know, we can't, our platform can't help you with your security review. Um, or the other challenge I had was that um, we, we essentially would get into arguments with an auditor themselves over whether or not something was an actual risk for us. When they weren't technology oriented, they were kind of used to the processes of testing. That's what they do well, you know, whether it's financial audit or security audit, the auditor does a good job of testing. That's what they're meant to do. Um, so I talked to colleagues, you know, the very next thing is go talk to a bunch of people and they, had similar problems and similar complaints as I did, you know, that, that there were not tools in the marketplace that would help the company trying to get an audit be their own company and get the certification accomplished. Um, and so the next thing is that I, I, I did have a couple of things that I was 
optimizing for before I, you know, what I wanted out of the next startup, essentially. One thing is that I was emotionally ready to be a CEO again, or I, th I thought I was, and I'm holding up pretty good, Chris. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, that was good. Yeah. Um, uh, enough time had burned away from the first one that I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to do that again. And I, I had uh, been a CTO for some founders that were epic uh, founders and amazing friends and colleagues. And I was like, I was inspired by them, you know, to, to, to go at it again. Uh, I wanted it to be a venture capital backed startup this time. You know, I had bootstrapped a great organization and gotten it sold. And um, it was intriguing to me. That, that was a new experience for me. I'm always trying to grow it too, right? I think not enough entrepreneurs in the CEO role or the founder role, ask them what career growth they're getting out of the startup that they're doing. And so I need that to stay engaged and excited about what I'm doing. And, and so that was important to me to do a venture capital backed startup. I thought the problem, you know, the problem has existed for a while. So we knew that there was some competition in the marketplace. I just thought all the solutions were very dissatisfactory, you know, for, for, for what, what a real CTO needed to operate a good security practice. That team thing comes into play here finally again. It's not me. I, I, I love that I hold the title of co-founder. It's very precious to me. It means a lot. But any organization you're going to get off the ground has, is a group of people at the end of the day. And so I actually um, worked with a, uh, an incubator in Seattle, Washington called Madrona Venture Labs. I you know, gave them the idea and they pressure tested the heck out of me in all the right ways. You know? And so through the six months of you know, working with the incubator, by the time we founded StrikeCraft in February of 2020, um, I had a real clear line of sight on what our customers needed, how much they were willing to pay, whether or not we had a market big enough to entice venture capitalists to invest in us, and then the type of story that I wanted to tell about who StrikeCraft was going to be. And that led to us getting our um, seed uh, seed round with Madrona Venture Group, Hope Cochran, um, uh, led the board. She's a phenomenal board member with us. And, uh, and they're a bellwether for the Pacific Northwest for enterprise SaaS applications. And, you know, by then we were off to the races. I had a lot, of, I mean, there's a ton of like painful stories between her and there, <laughs> but, but we were, we had some funding. We had the backing of some really intelligent champions uh, that were smart about the space. And, um, and so really good. Then it goes back to team. You have to start forming up the team. Who was my co-founder? Who's our chief technology officer? You know, who's my VP of product? Who's going to drive this thing, you know, in a way? And when I think about those decisions, I think about picking people that I was willing to turn the steering wheel over to. Um, how large is the team now? Uh, I think we're almost 40 staff members growing quite quickly. Awesome. Um, we just, just added three new developers this quarter. Our culture is so good, Chris. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to like gush over us for a second. Of course. Our culture is so good that we have more applicants than developer positions. And I'm the only startup we hear about that says that type of thing. That is, that is 100% true. Like, yeah, there is a super tight labor market around developers right now. Um, so to be able to say that, kudos to you, because that is a very good place to be in. Um, Team effort, Chris. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's got to be, right? I mean, it, you got to have those that can evangelize you know, and, and, and back up the, the culture that you have built. So that makes a ton of sense. Um, very cool. Uh, you know, with, with where you guys are now, you know, where do you imagine the company to be idealistically, but then also let's just say more conservatively five years from now? I think that um, five years from now, it's, it's not unreasonable at all to see StrikeGraph, you know, doing between 75 and 100 million in revenue. This is a quickly growing space. There's a lot of need. And actually there's a lot of untapped product opportunity that um, StrikeGraph is designed to take advantage of. And so what we hope is our product continues to improve. We continue to reshape the marketplace for what a good product is like we have already done. And that, um, that drives really phenomenal growth. With that growth, you know, I think about all the opportunities provided to the teammates that started with us early, 
that are growing in their careers, taking on higher uh, responsibilities or broader responsibilities. And, and that's very exciting for me. Also a return on investment for our investors. We, we are super grateful that they um, have believed in us and invested in us. And we, we'd love to see them rewarded for that. You know, and they put in hard work as well, for sure. Cool. We're, we're about to wrap things up here. You know, I just want to, uh, as we kind of hit the top of the hour, but, uh, you know, going back to, to, you know, those, I think some of the war stories, you know, of, of like starting a business is like, uh, it's to me, those are like the super relatable things. Cause as founders, we all go through that, right? It's like, how do you get to market fit? And, and it's a battle, it's an uphill battle. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it, you know? And, you see so many really, really smart and intelligent people that just don't get past a certain phase for whatever reason. Um, but what, you know, you laughed about it and I can, I'm imagining that you have a couple of those stories, but yeah, with strike graph, you know, like in the earlier days, like, um, yeah, it seems like you went through a process was very logical, you know, uh, but like to actually get product off the ground and then getting like your first, first few customers that maybe aren't like friendlies, right? Like, how do you how do you go through that, and what were some of like the, yeah, the hurdles or obstacles that you're proud to have overcome, but was maybe in those moments like very tough? Yeah, one thing, a couple of things we did to set us our, ourselves up for success before we ever started down the path, is that we picked a, a solution or a problem solution space that people were already comfortable spending money to solve. Now that means you have competitors, right? So anyone that's thinking about doing a startup, one of the things I recommend is understand it. Are you five years ahead of your market? Because I did that over and over and over again, right? Like we built a product that was so far ahead of the market that it was hard to find early adopters that really realized the value. Um, I actually think if you're trying to build a, a venture capital backed business, you need to pull a little closer to current time and what problems people are solving and what they're willing to spend money on. Because you're inventing that is incredibly hard. I mean, I people look at Uber and they're like, oh, they invented ride share. And I'm like, actually, there were taxis before that, right? Like what they did is they gave new technology so that you as a consumer were better informed about the product you were buying. That's valuable, actually. It's, it's okay to say that, right? Um, so I, I do think you can you can set yourself up a little bit for success by saying people are already buying this. There is already a need but there's a better, a better mousetrap that, that can be built. Um, the next thing that was important, and I, I don't think people do this enough, is that our first five customers were almost like a services engagement and not a full product engagement. And we knew our goal was to get them successfully certified or audited. And so we just said, let's, let's walk with our customer through this and get them through the audit. And after we got about five or six, what we wound up with was a really large um, content database and ontological structure that we realized was very powerful in the hands of any customer. And that became the core of our technology. So I realize that people are terrified of doing services businesses, but I actually really recommend that you do it by hand the first couple of times. And, and we found a logarithmic um, reduction in the amount of times things take in StrikeGraph. So at first we cost 85% less than a typical consulting engagement for the same exact problem. The second time we do it, we're half as expensive. And then the third time we do it, once we've implemented the first round of pilot technologies, we're about 20% as expensive. And so there's nothing wrong with driving through that optimization process. I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> i mean you know that's that it, it speaks volumes and i feel like yeah people are out there just trying to like build these get the cart before the horse you yeah. know which is like at the end of the day you're going to shoot yourself in the foot because until you get users that are in it like you don't know what their actual little day-to-day -day idiosyncrasies of actually implementation look like until you go through it with them so Yes, you're going to guess that you're going to be solving, you know, and I and, and maybe sometimes it's like fingers crossed that you're solving 50% of it, but there might be like that 10% that is the biggest bottleneck for them that takes them the longest amount of time that you just didn't spend the time to understand. And if you don't, they're not going to buy your product, you know, even if it's solving 80, 90% of the stuff, right? So, um, yeah, I think walking through it and understanding it and then 
identifying those kind of common threads around the pain that you guys can then use and build technology to solve for, it's that's huge. And that's literally what we're doing now. <laughs> it's like, I feel like the, you know, having spent the time, you know, two to three years, like going through the service part of it, understanding the manual components, um, even though it's fragmented, because uh, anything can be built, anything can be automated at the end of the day. And it's just really knowing those little things is critical. It's almost distracting to realize what you could build, right? Instead of focusing on the customer. And what we found in doing those, you know, helping customers design a security practice that can be audited is that there's a lot of nuance to doing it well. And we baked that into our core concepts of our platform. And that's why we do things like, oh, we've decided we want to do a new standard like HIPAA, 30 days to get it added to the system. Any customer can take advantage of it. Oh, well, we um, realized that we could build an AI tool that answers security questionnaires automatically without you having to build up a database of answers or anything. Very powerful stuff because we not only did we put the horse in front of the cart, but we figured out where the whole train was trying to go and we mapped onto that value prop, right? Like I need a trust asset. I need to get the revenue in the door. That's what I want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's awesome that you guys are helping companies get unblocked from that and shorten their sales cycle, probably from something that they never even anticipated in the first place, which is awesome. Um, that's cool. Well, congratulations on, on the success so far. You know, two years, that's short, uh, but it seems like you guys are on the right path. Um, and I can't wait to see where you guys end up in the next few years. So um, kudos to you again. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it is really great to hear your story. Love the fact that you come from a theater background. Um, love to have you back on maybe, you know, another, you know, six months, a year from now, kind of see where you guys are. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for the chat. It's a lot of fun to share the, the, the history. Of course, of <laughs> yeah. course. And everybody's interested in these kinds of stories. You know, I think like, yeah, from the entrepreneurs to those that are actually in it right now, I think it's great to, to have that sense of community from, from other founders that have gone through these things also before. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. We'll talk have to you soon. Have a great day. Bye. Mm -hmm. Bye.